Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Facebook Live from Alzheimer's Orange County. My name is Melissa Klabe. I'm the Director of Education here at Alz OC, and I'm joined, as I am many mornings, by Miss Kim Bailey. Hey, Kim. Good morning, Melissa. Good morning, everyone. Kim is, of course, Programs and Education Specialist at Alzheimer's Orange County. And this morning, the two of us are going to be talking about early memory loss and specifically what we can do if a loved one of ours um, is showing signs of early memory loss. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between changes that we see in normal aging, as well as some signs that something more serious be might be going on and we want to investigate. Um, and, and see a healthcare provider. Um, and then we'll talk about really practical things that we can do for our friends or family. We often don't know how to help um, or what to do. We feel kind of stuck. And so I know I did at least. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk through that a little bit. Um, before we get started, I wanna of course thank our sponsor. This morning's sponsor is Irvine Clinical Research. ICR is a clinical research provider in Southern California. They deliver clinical research opportunities and solutions to participants and sponsors. Uh, they offer all their study related medical care and medications at no cost if you're a qualified participant. And they also do memory screenings, education about brain health and nutrition and more. I think Dr. Trin is actually live right now doing his own Facebook Live. Um, I was on there for a little bit. Um, we're so thankful for their partnership and their sponsorship for many of our Healthy Brain classes and classes like these. And if you're interested in learning more about them, please visit IrvineClinical.com. All right, so let's dive in here. Um, first, we're going to talk a little bit about what is dementia. I mean, that's definitely the one of the most common questions I get if I'm out doing a talk. What is Alzheimer's? What is dementia? Are they the same thing? Is one worse than the other? Kim, do you want to take us through this? Yeah, you know, I've been doing this a long time and this uh, continues to be a confounding question. When I'm out in the community doing education, uh, I even have families who will say to me, you know, I'm so relieved. Uh, Mom doesn't have Alzheimer's disease. She has dementia. And so it's kind of a starting point for any discussion when I try to explain that Alzheimer's disease is a form of dementia. In fact, it is the most common form of dementing illnesses. And uh, I, I think it's been estimated that it makes up what about Melissa, do you think about 75% yeah, of the I, cases? I from 60 to 80, I usually go with 70. Right, right. And so while it is, it is the most common form of dementia, there are other types of dementias as well. And so, um, you know, really what we need for people to do when they suspect that there's something wrong is to go in and get a memory screen, get a thorough or get a thorough workup for dementia. And so the term dementia is just sort of a broad umbrella term that describes any type of uh, progressive degenerative brain impairment that involves memory loss, uh, changes in personality, um, uh, behavior, judgment, and you know the ability to really take care of oneself. So if you think of dementia as an umbrella, mm -hmm. underneath that umbrella, there are many different types of dementia and you can see some of those other types there. So there's Lewy body, frontal temporal lobe dementia, uh, Parkinson's associated with dementia, alcohol related dementia. The list is long, but by far Alzheimer's disease is number one. Yeah, and this is, as you mentioned, a, a more simplified graphic. I kind of like it. We show the umbrella one often um, just mm -hmm. to show how many different types there are, and there's over 100 different types. These are the progressive irreversible types on this slide, and they're the most common. We also mm -hmm. often mention reversible types or pseudo right. dementias, things like depression or um, changes in medication or nutrition that could affect one's thinking. And that's why it's really important, too, to get a screening or a proper diagnosis in fact, to rule out or rule in those those things that may be treatable. And even if somebody has Alzheimer's and a thyroid condition or and dementia, and we can right. treat the thyroid condition or dementia, um, the Alzheimer's we can't treat at this time, but those treatable right. things may improve cognition somewhat if somebody has multiple yeah. things going on. 
Yeah, and it's complicated because there isn't one single clinical test that people can go to the doctor and get to determine whether or not there's a presence of dementia, of a dementia. And so, uh, and I think, Melissa, don't you agree that people are kind of scared uh, to just go and do that whole process Absolutely. of testing. So if we can just make a suggestion, if you're worried about yourself or a loved one, a starting point could be a simple memory screen. And we can do that for you. We offer free memory screenings and we used to offer them face to face and we're able to do them virtually now. Yes. And so you can uh, sign up for a free screening and then take that and if for some reason your results fall outside of the uh what how would how would you put it expected Molly? range for your age expected range for your age then you can take those results uh to an assessment center or your doctor uh, if you need referrals we can give you those and then you can go through more extensive testing uh, it's just a starting point. And in fact, we recommend that for everyone uh, of a certain age, you know, just to have a baseline. Because, you know, for all of us as we're aging, there are certain age related changes that occur. And so I think it's really part of successful aging to have a memory screen and just to sort of know where you stand, don't you think? Absolutely. And that's a perfect segue into the next few slides here where we'll talk about some normal things that you can expect as we age, as our brains slow down a little bit, just as mm -hmm. our bodies slow down a little bit as we age, our brains do the same thing. And that's normal and to be expected. Yeah. And so um, we'll start with this one, uh, memory loss that disrupts daily life. Um, so memory loss in general, so normal aging would be occasionally forgetting a name or appointment. We all have those tip of the tongue moments. I know I do where yep. I'm forgetting either where I put something or who is that person's name or what is that word that I'm trying to think of? And oftentimes you'll remember it much later than when you actually need it. Um, but that's pretty normal. We all have, um, you know, moments like that throughout our week. Um, do you want to talk about um, what may be a, a more serious sign? Sure. Time? And I'm just kind of laughing to myself because I forget names and then I remember them later. And typically that is like three in the morning. <laughs> I'll wake yeah. up in bed and go, oh, yeah, that was, you know, Melissa. You know, and <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to pick on you. As no, that's fine. <laughs> but, I mean, what's happening there is I'm still able to retrieve that name, but right. my retrieval is delayed. But if, if, if I have dementia, then it's a little bit different. It means I, I've lost the ability to retrieve that name at all. So you see the difference there with normal aging. I might have a, a slowed or delayed ability to retrieve information. But if I have a dementia, then that means I'm not able to save information and retrieve it later. So, you know, whereas occasionally forgetting names or appointments and remembering later is normal aging, if you're forgetting the de dentist appointment um, that you've been reminded about like multiple times mm -hmm. in the same day or asking for the same information repeatedly, that's an indication of a more serious problem it could be an indication of a more serious problem. Absolutely. So the next one here, challenges in planning or solving problems. So normal would be uh, occasionally forgetting to pay a bill on time, similar to, to the last slide we talked about, that kind of occasional mishaps here and there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What about something a little more serious, Kim? Right, and so we've worked with families where we've heard from the well spouse, and they've reported that, um, you know, the mortgage hasn't been paid for several months and they suddenly are receiving, you know, a notice that the house is going to be foreclosed on. That's a dramatic example. Right. Um, or we hear from someone that, uh, you know, suddenly the wife is not able to prepare meals that they've, that she's you know, prepared time and time again over the years. So things that used to be done by rote can't mm -hmm. be done anymore. So absolutely. Yeah. 
difficulty completing familiar tasks. So normal sign of aging might be needing help to learn a new device, right? A new smartphone, something that we haven't had experience with before. There's lots of that probably going on right now with all the new technology we're all using as we all go virtual with our lives for this period of time. Zoom, Facebook, things like that. Um, things you haven't grown up with, you know. Um, what about more serious signs, Kim? Right. So a more serious sign that there might be a dementia present would be if you're forgetting how to use a familiar device uh, like the microwave or the stove or what we see a lot, the remote, uh, the mm -hmm. TV remote, or you're getting lost going to familiar places like the supermarket. Right. Um, I'll share one uh, personal example here that um, happened with my mom. So my mom was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease about eight years ago now. And she was actually working as a nurse at the time um, she began to experience early memory loss. She was a registered nurse in a hospital and um, began having trouble with things at her job like IVs, like forgetting the steps, not knowing how to do something. And she had done this for over 30 years as a nurse, you know, something that should be really routine things like charting, um, just things that required kind of multiple steps and kind of had to organize in your mind. And um, not only did she notice, but her colleagues began to take notice, of course. And that was a really difficult time for her. And, and I wish we had kind of been more in tune with what was going on. Um, of course, like many other families, it took us a couple of years to get a diagnosis because she was so young. And so that was a really frustrating time. Um, but you know, if we had kind of been in, more in tune with what was going on, I think we could have supported her better. Um, but I know that, that that was a really challenging time for her and something that, again, you know, should have been something she was very used to doing, but, but became difficult for her. Melissa, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, her colleagues weren't helping to cover for her as well. Yeah. <laughs> because that seems to be the case so many times. Uh, right. Kind of jump in, in early and, yeah. stages are good at covering up for themselves and then people around them just sure. kind of operate in that realm as well. Yeah. And so um, we see evidence of that a lot. Um, I'm just looking at that microwave and remembering that the uh, person I cared for, that was the sign that it was time for me to move in with her. Mm because I used to provide her care. Uh, I, I arranged for her care during the day while I was at work and she would have dinner on her own and she usually heated up like a lean cuisine or mm -hmm. a, she loved chicken pot pies, Ugh. but that was her favorite. And, you know, all of a sudden I realized I started going over there at night. She wasn't eating because I realized she couldn't operate the microwave anymore. And kind of simultaneously with that, I realized that it was very warm in the house because she could mm -hmm. no longer operate the air conditioner. And so right. that was, you know, my cue that it was time for her to have overnight care as well. So, yeah. yeah. So. All right. New problems with words or in speaking and writing. This is definitely a big um, indication that, um, you know, maybe a sign of Alzheimer's disease or dementia because language is one of those areas actually that, that should not change much, if at all, or it should get even better. As we get older, we can still learn new vocabulary and things like that. So if there are significant changes in language, writing, speaking, um, that is definitely a sign that, that you wanna investigate. Um, again, the tip of the tongue moments that I mentioned, those are pretty common, occasionally forgetting the word. We've, we've all been there, we all have those. Um, Kim, do you wanna describe what it looks like when it's a more serious problem? Sure, sure, with normal aging, you know, problem, problems with concentration and focus can occur, but if you're noticing that you're having trouble following a conversation a lot, and or your loved one is, um, and then particularly if they're, they're having problems with naming objects and calling things by the wrong name, like hand clock. Right, instead of this. <laughs> um, watch, you yeah. know, um, or milk pourer hmm. for, Kramer, you know, they they come up with descriptor descriptor words, but they're not able to name common objects. So that's a definite sign that they may have Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. Right. And that, I mean, like all of these things is incredibly frustrating for people. And they, you know, they are likely realizing that that's happening 
And so they may, you know, like all of us, what would our reaction be to, to get defensive sometimes or, or withdrawn like the next one that we'll talk about here, um, withdrawing from work or social activities. Um, right. Normal would be all of us feeling, you know, kind of weary about work sometimes, family, social obligations, Zoom happy hours, you know, whatever it is. Um, you know, we all get exhausted and, and need some time to just kind of be away from people. It's pretty, and depending on how, you know, introverted you are, that might vary from person to person. Um, but it's really the change that we're looking for. If somebody was really outgoing before and loved being around people, and now we're noticing kind of that withdrawal, um, you want to talk about that a little bit more? Right. Well, when you notice people starting to uh, skip out on really beloved activities, um, making excuses like, oh, I don't feel well, or I'm too tired to go to church, or no, I don't really want to go to lunch this week. Um, the reason they're doing that is because I mentioned earlier, they're, they're trying to cover up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fear factor, we think. We mm -hmm. can only, you know, kind of guess. But I always thought it was probably they're just afraid they're going to make a mistake and reveal that something's wrong or embarrass themselves in front of their peers. And so, um, and they just kind of overall lose their initiative. Uh, and so those can be signs that of a greater problem, definitely. And here, I think it's also important that we mention that this can also, this is also what depression might look like, right? This withdrawal yep. and, you know, and they often do go hand in hand. Um, that's why it's really important when we do memory screenings, we also screen for depression. And if we do find an indication that that might be present, we really encourage people, hey, go to your doctor, get this checked out. Um, if this is something that's that's happening, we can work towards treating that and that may improve some cognitive symptoms. Again, if they have Alzheimer's, the beginning of Alzheimer's and, and depression. Um, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's isn't gonna go away if we treat the depression, but their cognition may improve slightly from just treating that depression. So it's really, really important that that's not something that's just overlooked or we say, oh, that's just normal or to be expected. Um, we need yep. to treat that as you know a, a real problem that we can do something about. Yeah, I mean, as we go through these slides and talk about normal versus signs of dementia, it just makes me, even more committed to uh, educating everyone about the importance of diagnosis. Because if you're going through these these changes or if you suspect things are happening and things are changing or if you're seeing these signs in a loved one, delaying is only gonna make things worse. And there is always the chance that tests will reveal something treatable. Right. And here we're going back and talking about those reversible symptoms that Melissa mentioned, depression or over medication or a thyroid imbalance or some kind of an infection that's not been treated appropriately. So, you know, hiding in, in fear is not the answer. The answer is getting a screening, getting the testing and, you know, the, what the testing does is systematically rule out any possible uh, reason for these symptoms. And, um, you know, I, I just uh, really want to underscore the importance yeah. of that because it's important to know where you stand. And we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes because yeah. if it is dementia, there are things that we need to do and there's things that we can do. Absolutely. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. So million dollar question, how can we help? Um, we all know that we want to help our loved ones or friends that are that are going through this, um, they want help, the person with memory loss and their care partner, whoever it is. Um, but oftentimes we don't know how to help and they don't know how to ask for help. So this is kind of just a really a starting point of brainstorming. It kind of breaks down the different types of help that we might think about, um, makes it kind of a more manageable thing to think about. And this comes from uh, a manual called I Support. It's from the World Health Organization. And I will put the link in the comments because I think it's a really great resource. Um, it's really long, actually. It's filled with all kinds of practical tips. And I liked the way they broke down asking for help and thinking about ways to give help. So I just want to talk through some of these a little bit. Um, practical help, of course, is kind of what it sounds like. Things around the house, cleaning, shopping, um, oh, someone says they don't always want to help. That's unfortunate. Um, there, of course, are going to be some family members, right? But hopefully we'll talk about kind of 
um, figuring out who your team is and who your support team is. And if there are people that you can, those people you can call at three in the morning, those, you know, the people that will rally around you. It might not always be the close family. Um, it might be some other friends or, or other people in your community that are going through the same thing that understand it. Um, and maybe it's a matter of figuring out how to meet those people. And, and maybe we'll have some opportunities for that as well. Um, but practical help looks like things around the house. Um, I, quick story from us. Uh, it was the beginning of the pandemic in March. I think my, so I live, we take care of my mom. I live with my dad, my husband, it's a full house here. Um, I think he had mentioned offhand to a neighbor, we're out of paper towels, something like that. I don't want to go to the store. You know, it was kind of that crazy beginning of the pandemic time. And, you know, we come home and there's a thing of paper towels on our doorstep. Like they had just gone and done that and just dropped it off and not said a word. And and that was really sweet and just something that really stuck with me as, you know, they didn't have to do that. Um, it can be as simple as something like that, just knowing, you know, what what that person needs and, and bringing that really tangible thing to them. Um, any other examples of practical help that you can think of, Kim? Um, I think I'll wait because I'm going to give a, a great uh, example of that okay. when I talk about Roger and Lucy. But okay. Yeah. So I'll let you just keep going because okay. you're kind of on a roll here. All right. I'll talk to you <laughs> these briefly. Um, emotional support. Again, what it sounds like, uh, just being a, an ear, someone they can talk to, um, not necessarily having to have all the answers, um, but just listening, uh, encouraging them to seek professional help if they need a counselor or um, encouraging them to call our helpline. We have um, trained professional social workers and staff just ready to take anyone's call if they have a question or need a referral or just need to talk through something that can be really invaluable. So um, this cannot be, you know, the importance of this cannot be overstated. Um, help planning activities is really important. That's why we dedicate a whole class to it um, once a month or once every other month, um, because it can be difficult, especially as we're now home all the time. Um, thinking of things that we can do to to engage our loved ones um, with whatever you know stage or abilities they they have, um, maybe that looks like a, a neighbor coming over to to go for a walk with a loved one to give us a little time around the house, or um, it can be. I mean, there's endless things. It's, again, we have a whole class on this, um, but that can be a real area where someone could offer real help in. Um, information. Uh, there is a lot to know. Um, and we cover a lot of it in many of our classes. Um, but there's so much out there. And um, just having having a friend or family member that's like a dedicated, you know, information guru, um, keeping up on resources, keeping up on referrals um, in the community, that can be helpful too. Um, if you want that type of help, um, if it's unsolicited, that then that's a different story. And um, I've you know received unsolicited advice before from friends and family. Kind of have to gently say, you know, that's okay. Thank you so much. I know it's coming from a place of love, but you know we've we've got this. Um, so, and there are many other types of examples, but but just brainstorming, thinking of ways to help can can be a start when we feel like there's nothing we can do, or there's I don't people are offering help, but I don't know how to tell them how to help us. Um, right. And Kim, let's talk about Roger and Lucy because they're just a, a really cool example, I'm, super unique. Yes. But before I do, I want to address Sue because you're you're so right, Sue. There yeah. is often resistance, and so uh, I just want to say that the, all the things on the slide before, you can do those things yourself. You can gather resources. You can get yourself educated. You can get support. Uh, join a caregiver support group so you can lie, you know, you can you can lay the foundation for all of that on your own working. Well, not on your own, but working with your family and resources around you, uh, because unfortunately, yes, sometimes they are very resistant and they don't they're in denial. They don't think anything's wrong with them. They don't understand why this is going on. And so unfortunately, you have to kind of walk that path on your own, gather those resources and support support around you and uh, hopefully in time that resistance will fade. So you make a very good point and I just wanted to acknowledge that Sue. It's true, we do see a lot of resistance. So as far, as far as getting support, <laughs> this is just one person's approach, but it's it, it happened a few years ago and it kind of stuck with me. So I wanted to share it with all of you. A uh, lot of times families are reluctant to share the news of a diagnosis. And um, whether it's because they feel there's a stigma or you know they're embarrassed or whatever, I wanted to share that Roger 
uh, who gave us permission to tell his story, felt the opposite. He wanted to broadcast the news of his dear wife's diagnosis far and wide. And he's a businessman. You can see from his picture, you know, he owned, he actually is he owned and operated a corporation for many years. And he uh, sent an email broadcast to everyone in his contacts. Uh, family, etc., relatives, friends, and he made the announcement that his dear wife Lucy was diagnosed with early Alzheimer's disease and he needed their help and uh, would invited them to join in Lucy's journey. And to that end, he attached an Excel spreadsheet with a whole list of things that people could do and sign up to do to help Lucy. And I have to tell you, it had everything from small things to large things. It had, you know, I will take Lucy to her hair appointment. Uh, I will pick up groceries. I will come and stay with Lucy while Roger goes and golfs on the weekend. I mean, it was myriad tasks. And people filled that up. And he used that chart, and he's still using it. And it was just so effective and everyone could not wait to jump on the Lucy bandwagon. And he had so much support, it was coming out of his ears. So he, you know, it was just really wild. He used a business approach to enlist support for Lucy. And I'm not suggesting that everybody go out and do that. But what I am suggesting is that you ask for help and that you be specific in what you ask for because people often First of all, they don't know you need help until you tell them. And so with your loved one's permission, share the news with people. Half the time they know something's wrong anyway. Yeah. They suspect and they know. And, you know, if some of them don't step up to the plate, some may go away and let them because, you know, the people who are your real friends hopefully will participate and then be specific about the things that you need. And when they say, well, I'd love to help, what can I do? You know, be ready with a few answers, you know, with some tasks and um, share the care because this is often a long journey. People with this illness are generally speaking in the absence of other types of conditions, people will stay healthy for quite some time. And so, it's uh, you're going to need some support along the way. They will need support along the way. So let's make it Absolutely. work. Bring in yeah. other people. <laughs> Great. And I feel like this was kind of a almost like a low tech cool. Like he was ahead of his time because there's websites now like CaringBridge.com. Yes. I think is one of them, and other ones that kind of organize that. I don't know if you have to pay for them. I, I honestly haven't used them myself, no. but. Okay. So yeah, same thing where you can kind of create tasks and people can sign Absolutely. up meals and things like that. So, so, but I love his just simple Excel sheet. It's, it gets the yep. job done. Yeah. And thanks again, Sue, for your additional comment. Yeah. I, it's, we it's hear not you. Place we to hear be. Absolutely. You. Yeah. And um, yeah, we're big on, on caregiver support as well. So, Absolutely. you know, we, we understand. Um, gathering information, I, I mentioned, um, there's all kinds of things that, that need to be gathered, all types of information, referrals for specialists, which we have again on, in our helpline, um, information on how to get it, that really important comprehensive diagnosis, as Kim mentioned, we do have a, a fact sheet on that. If you're interested, call our helpline, um, legal and financial matters. Again, we offer, uh, legal and financial, um, workshops. Information on healthy living, keeping your brain healthy. We got that too. Um, and, and information on clinical trials. And clinical trials are a very personal decision. Every family has to decide for themselves, every person, if that's something that they want to you know, get information about and consider. Um, many people are very willing because they feel like it's something that they can do, you know, as a person um, experiencing this and to further research, you know, that the first treatment is going to come from a clinical trial. We know that, you know, that's, that's how treatments and medications are born. So, um, but again, that's a, that's a highly personal decision. And, and if it's something you're considering, we do have information on that as well. And again, broken record, I would encourage you to call our helpline and talk through that with um, people who understand as well. And I know another place where you can get all of this information. And where's that? in the living well with early memory loss group. That's right. <laughs> what a great series. <laughs> um, we'll okay, 
talk about wanna, that in just a minute. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to talk through this, um, talking about sure. plan, the importance of planning ahead? Sure. So, you know, when a person is, in fact, diagnosed with early memory loss, uh, when they do receive a diagnosis, uh, earlier the better. Uh, that's another reason not to wait and sit on this because we want that person to have uh, self-determination that just means autonomy. We want to put them in the driver's seat with making decisions that affect their future while they have the ability to do that. And so we need to have a series of discussions with them about what matters to them. And uh, when I see that term, what matters, it reminds me of some work that um, Melissa and I did uh, in some, some hospital training. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, what, <laughs> I don't know if I can explain it right, but in a hospital, people are always walking around saying, what's, what's the matter with what's you? What's the matter, yeah. Yeah, what's the matter? Talking about your symptoms. And then instead of asking people what's the matter, we need to ask them what matters to you. And this is a particularly true when people have early memory loss. So in thinking ahead, what's important to you? How do you want to live your life? Because this disease can last for a long time. And so I think we're talking about bucket lists here. And, you know, plans change, priorities shift, but we need to know what lies ahead and what's important to people. So even creating an important paper, like what are your goals right now? We need to talk about what are the things left unfinished? What needs to be checked off that list? Advanced care planning is really a, a series of legal, actual legal decisions that have to be made about who will step into my shoes. And listen, folks, this isn't just about Alzheimer's. This is about anybody over the age mm -hmm. of 18. I have, you know, named a person who can step into my shoes and make medical decisions on my behalf. Should I become incapacitated? I have a person who will step into my shoes. Should uh, I become incapacitated? That someone who can make financial decisions on my behalf. So those kinds of, of uh, plans, I need, you know, people need to name agents to work on their behalf. So some legal and estate planning, some end of life planning, those kinds of discussions, however uncomfortable, they shouldn't be uncomfortable, but in our society, they are. Yeah, very so taboo. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, really, but it's circle of life to me. But, you know, they're tough. But we need, if those discussions haven't taken place, they need to have to take place and they need to be sort of signed, sealed, delivered from a legal standpoint. And then we need to look at our lifestyle because there's a prescription for healthy living that fits very nicely when you have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or another dementia. There are some healthy strategies that can help improve quality of life and that I believe can help with people's functioning. And, you know, sometimes people just need to make some small changes in their diet and their lifestyle, uh, exercising, cognitive stimulation, sleep, uh, stress reduction, et cetera, and even just making some small changes can make a big difference later on. So Absolutely. that kind of planning needs to take place. And I think it's very important, not only for the person with the illness and Hey, if they're resistant, then let's look at the, I mean, it's equally important for the, the care partner. Right. So yeah. equally important. It could be something that is done together, you know, hey, I want to think about what's important to me as, you know, we get older, I want to yeah. think about what would happen if something happened to me, you know, let's do this together. That's right. We do not want the care partner getting lost in all this, in yeah. the caregiving. We want to help them keep their sanity as well. Yes. So, so there's a place to talk about all of this <laughs> and more and to meet others who are going through the similar situation uh, and it's called the living well with early memory loss series and we're doing them monthly and we have one coming up with openings we have openings and that will take place on september 9th 16th and 23rd from 1 30 to 3. so this is a group that is for a person who has just received a diagnosis or is in the process of going through the diagnostic uh, pro, uh, 
Oh, we're we're finding, we're finding. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should teach it and be in it. Um, this is for a person who might be going through the diagnostic process right now, uh, or is in the process of getting the testing done, uh, or a person who's just received a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. And we come together on Zoom and we talk about coping techniques. We talk about healthy strategies, like the things I just talked about. Um, we talk about medications. Uh, we talk to each other. It's a place where people don't feel like they're the only ones going through this. And if you, you know of someone that uh, is appropriate for this group, we encourage you to contact us and let us Absolutely. know. Absolutely. Please do. So I rarely let a class go by without some sort of quote from a person with dementia um, because I think it's so important to, um, and, and their voices aren't often heard, um, you know, to, to understand a little bit about what their experience is, um, especially in the early memory loss stages. And, and we have a, a real, um, you know, I think our, our perception, our societal perception of dementia is extremely negative. Um, and it is sad. It's the truth. I mean, I've lived through it. Um, it is very, it's the hardest thing I've had to go through. You know, it's, it's ex incredibly difficult. Um, but I think, I always think back, if I could change something about kind of our journey, if I could go back, um, it would be uh, changing my perspective a little bit earlier, figuring out how to um, kind of understand um, the changes that, that my mom was going through and how can I take her abilities that are remaining and just use those and maximize those to to our benefit to live every day as positively as possible as, as dr glendo talks about more joy than not right yes. um often got stuck in the doom and gloom cycle which is totally normal and it happens um but i think uh, the words from christine bryden here are really important to think about how we think about dementia matters and it, it impacts how we treat our loved ones so um, she says, our main fear is the loss of self associated with dementia. We face an identity crisis. We all believe the toxic lie of dementia that the mind is absent and the body is an empty shell. But we can find a new identity as an emotional being. In our relationships, we can connect at a deeper level. And I think it really, it, it is how you see it. And um, my mom taught me so much about living and life, you know, in her years of dementia, we were so much more present with each other than we probably would have been otherwise. Um, would I trade, you know, that of course I want you and I would want her to, to not have Alzheimer's if I was given the choice. Um, but that's the dealt we, that's the hand we were dealt, you know? And so to, to be able to learn from that, maximize her ability, um, and, and kind of reshape what dementia is that, that does did and does make a big difference for me. Um, I, I want to read a couple other quotes here and then you can jump in. Um, these are also people with dementia. A man named Richard Taylor, he was a physician actually. He said, I just want others to try to figure me out, to understand me, to love me as I love them. Um, this other person says, I've heard people say, you don't look like you've got dementia. Fancy that. How are we supposed to look? And that's a big thing too, right? We can't always tell you know, oftentimes we can't. And, and like in my experience, my mom was so young that no one would have expected her to have dementia if she says something kind of off in the grocery store or tells it, you know, a story that didn't really happen. And so, you know, it's really all about, you know, how can we, how can we love them in the midst of this and, and maximize the abilities that remain? Anything you want to add, Kim, on that? Oh, you're, I just want to add that you are such a beautiful caregiver, Melissa. Your mother is just really blessed by you, but um, and your whole family. But I was just thinking about this quote of Christine Bryden. Is yeah. it? Uh, it actually reminds me of a quote by one of your other heroes, oh, Dr. Power. That's right. <laughs> you got me hooked on him. I was reading. Yeah some of his things over the weekend and there is a simple quote he says we need to change our minds about people whose minds have changed i love that quote yes it's just it's so simple but so true it's really about just our expectations and stepping into their reality and accepting that they can't change you know yeah. and we have to we have to change we can we have to change and it, I can't help but think if, you know, we try kind of daily <laughs> to reduce the stigma that comes with dementia. It's a part of our mm -hmm. mission, you know, and I, 
right. I think hopefully one day if that stigma is lessened, um, we will encounter things like less resistance from our loved ones for help because it won't be such, you know, this thing that's, you know, just seen as this very, my life is over now and there's no, you know, nothing good that can come of it anymore. And it's very, very negative. And I think if we begin to shift that and change our perspective, then hopefully we can figure out, you know, how to love our loved ones more and, and how to maximize the life, whatever life they do have left. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we'll kind of finish here with talking about some practical ways that our communication might have to change. Um, again, we do an entire class on this, caring conversations, right, but we'll right. kind of do the highlights here. And, and I love the way you talk about this um, graphic here. So you want to talk us through this? Sure, sure. Well, this this is a very simple continuum, but I think I've always felt like it's very powerful because if you start over on the left side, it's important to realize that that's where our folks with dementia live. They live in a state of confusion, unfortunately. I mean, uh, sometimes it's not as profound. They have good days and bad days, just like we all do. But if you put yourselves in their shoes, if you lived in a state of constant confusion, uh, you, of course, would start to feel very uncomfortable. And when we as human beings feel uncomfortable, we tend to what? We act out. And so, you know, we sort of see this shift all the time with our loved ones where they get confused, they start to get upset and agitated, and then it can go into this expression of distress, which we used to call behaviors, but we try not to use that word anymore because it implies that they're being bad. And we know that this is beyond their control. So we don't use a punitive word like behavior. However, this cycle has to stop, right? Yeah. Because we know in dementia care that it can repeat all day, every day. And the good news is, is that we can, we do have the power to mitigate this cycle from repeating itself over and over again. Maybe we can't stop it all the time, but with the tools that we have at hand, if we can even stop it from happening part of the time, yeah. That's really good news because we don't want our loved ones to feel this way. We really don't. So we do have the power to to do better. And sometimes it's really, sometimes, unfortunately, it's about us and our approach. So let's talk about that a little bit. Because we know that, you know, really what we're trying to do with our loved ones goes beyond words. We're really there to try and make a connection with them because they're having language difficulties. They can't really always understand words. And in fact, research done, you know, seriously, a hundred years ago yeah. <laughs> determined, <laughs> determined that, you know, what makes conversations successful really it's more to do with our body language and our tone than the actual words that we use. And so as we're moving away from verbal to nonverbal communication with our loved ones, our tone and our affect and our body language mean so much and they set the stage, you know, for really uh, what's to come. We set the stage for successful connections. Yeah. And not I all always, the time because yeah. they're not perfect and they're not perfect, but. Absolutely. Yeah. But I always, when I look at this study and I look at the body language, the tone, the words, this is for all of us. This is not specific to dementia. So I always, I'm always like, okay, even in my com conversations with, you know, people who don't have dementia, like my body language, my tone is far more important than what I'm saying. Yeah. And this actually works in our favor with people with dementia, because what are they losing? They're losing the words, right. you know, and those other things are actually becoming even more heightened, like their emotions, like Christine Bryden said, we're becoming an emotional being. It's right. like my mom had this sixth sense, all of a sudden, she could just pick up on if I was distressed, if I was yes. anxious, and she would mirror that. And so I could then kind of use that again to my advantage if I was able to kind of take a breath and, you know, kind of exude a very gentle, calm demeanor, then that would likely, you know, transfer over to her or, or a smile, of course. That's, that's exactly um, right. That's exactly yeah. right. Now we're, you know, talking really about any stage of the illness, uh, yeah. you know, started out talking about early, but now this is applicable to anybody. So yeah. 
Yeah. Do you want to talk about this a little bit? Sure. So, you know, we're going to try to be on, you know, constant alert for our own feelings and body language as well as theirs. Because as Melissa just said, they're going to mirror our emotions. So if you feel like screaming, you know, <laughs> go out in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> and if you feel like crying, which you do, you do it in the shower, right? Many caregivers cried in the shower. So uh, you want to offer lots of comfort and lots of reassurance. I mean, you can't give enough uh, yeah. because remember that state of confusion they live in. So they need constant, you know, validation and compliments, smiles, I love yous. Try to avoid criticizing or correcting. It's there's no point in trying to be right anymore. And yeah. I don't know what it is about our society. We have to be right all the time. We're always yes, Googling we things. You know, we're in a conversation. <laughs> I, you know, and it's like, no, I don't think it happened in that year. I'm going to Google it. You know, so I would th spend no. the rest of the night trying to prove it. <laughs> it's better to be kind than to be right. And as Melissa, she said it kind of fast, but she was talking about mother telling a story that wasn't true. They do that all the time. It's called confabulation. Um, and it's, but it's, or we could just call it lying, but they don't have the ability to do that on purpose. They're not lying. They're just telling their right. truth. So let them tell about fighting in the war, you know, and, and they never served. It doesn't matter. I had a, a client, who tells a great told me a great story about his experience at Harvard and he was actually teasing me about going to Cal State Fullerton and he said he went to Harvard and he was kind of making fun of me for going to the state <laughs> university and he's like I went to Harvard and I said tell me about Harvard yeah and he's all gone and on about Harvard and his wife walked up behind me and said he never went to college <laughs> but it doesn't matter you know so just let them be right all the time and if they yeah. tell you you're wrong apologize and say I'm sorry so these yeah. are the things that we do and um, you know if they're if they're struggling for a word you know give give them a little time to try and figure it out but you might offer a guess if they're comfortable with that in the early stage though you have to ask permission yeah you you say do you want me to try to give you a word you ask permission to save, yeah. so they can save face. Absolutely. But just encourage nonverbal communication. What do I mean by that? You know, hugs, smiles, um, you know, just make a connection another way if you're not going to have these intense conversations anymore. You can do art and music. There's lots of ways to make connections that you, we talk too much, really, really. I <laughs> <laughs> I think you talked the exact right amount, Kim. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> and when we approach, we do not sneak up on people, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we don't stand and tower over them. We're respectful of body space. We approach from the front. Um, you know, when I'm working with my clients uh, in person, I don't know, forever, I hope we can do that again. Yeah. But I always say, hey, it's Kim, how you doing? You know, just to give them that clue, to help them save face. Yeah. You know, I don't say, remember my name or who guess am I? Who <laughs> am I? You know, and don't do that. That's yeah. just, ee, don't do that. Identify yourself, come down to their level. Um, you know, they do have visual problems, so you don't want to get in their face, but you do want to get at their eye level and you want to keep that nice, you know, personal space. Uh, always smiling and be inviting. Um, do speak slowly and clearly. And this is great advice for anyone over 50 because we all have <laughs> hearing loss due to um, noise. And so, you know, hearing loss and Alzheimer's is really bad. So we want to speak slowly and clearly and break down your sentences. Give them time to take it in and process it and give them time to respond to you. So really got to kind of step back and just take your time. Use that gentle and relaxed voice and yeah. tone. All and louder is not better louder <laughs> not better out louder no we don't want to do that don't we think don't you're mad at them right 
That's very yeah. irritating. Just very, slow, yeah. maybe a little bit deeper even of a voice if your voice tends to be high. That's um, good for hearing loss too. Yeah. yeah. So we'll kind of finish up here uh, with one of our all time favorite quotes. And this is actually a picture of my mom and I on the lake and 2014, Lake Mission Viejo out here. Um, this was a great day. Did she remember it? I don't think so. Um, but she remembered that we had a great time. She, you know, that carried over, I think for both of us for a long time. And it was a struggle kind of to get out on the water. Like she, you know, couldn't find what she wanted to wear. And she was constantly asking where we were going. And I just thought we need to mix it up here. We need to like shake out of our routine and do something different. And my best friend came with us and she actually took the picture. And so, you know, it was, it was such a great and joyful day. And she just had a smile on her face. She was being silly the whole time and, and what a treat it was. And, and I think a lot of times people think, well, if they're not going to remember it, you know, what's the point? And the point was, I remember it um, for one thing. And for another thing, you know, she, it was a great, it was a great day. And, you know, what is life if we're not trying to, to maximize the joy and have those great moments, right? Um, so my Angela, of course, I've learned people will forget what you said and what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And so that's true for all of us, but especially for our loved ones with cognitive changes, right? So um, I wanna mention a couple other uh, classes that we have coming up. We have one tomorrow, speaking of healthy brain classes, this is for anyone, anyone is welcome. It's via Zoom, so you do have to go over to our website and sign up. Um, it's just an hour class taught by Roxy, our memory uh, programs coordinator. She leads all our MindFit classes. It's a wonderful class packed with information. We would encourage you to go sign up on our website. And she's also teaching a series called Four Weeks to a Better Memory um, that uh, goes through all kinds of cool memory tricks and enhancing techniques. Um, and again, you know, for any of us, um, especially those of us that maybe are experiencing some, some of those normal age-related changes we talked about, um, she always says the first step to forming a memory is paying attention. So you learn things like that and how to just maximize, you know, our, our memory on a daily basis. Um, we also have our walk. Kim, do you want to talk about our walk for a second? Oh, gosh. Listen, we need everybody to get involved. We can't walk at Anaheim Stadium this year. We're going to work. Uh, we're going to walk virtually in our own neighborhoods, but with no less enthusiasm. We've got lots of people signing up, and you can form a team, or you can walk on one of our teams. I have a team. Melissa has a team, and we're all very excited to have you join us. And you can walk or run, and we'd love to see a huge turnout. Uh, we need you. We need you. Um, it's a great cause and it funds uh, the programs and services and education that we offer to our uh, clients and families that need that support desperately. So please go to our website and find out all about it and get involved. We'd yes, love to see you. Absolutely. There'll be and lots of I photos. People will be taking selfies and we'll be posting them online and I think we'll probably have some fun competitions and contests. Oh, I'm and, sure there'll yeah. be plenty of things on the day. Um, yeah. I just put a few links in the chat. I put a link to our Healthy Brain class tomorrow if you want to sign up, to our walk, please sign up for that, and to a recent blog that we posted on our website on the topic we talked about today. Um, some notes if you'd like to see those and how to join our, our early memory loss series. Um, of course, as always, please call our helpline. We would love to help you. We would love to just be an ear for you or offer you, you know, information or resources. Um, join our caregiver support group on Facebook. It is a closed private group. Nobody else besides who's in the group will see anything that you post. Um, so we would encourage you to, to join other caregivers there. Um, and again, thank you to Irvine Clinical Research for sponsoring this morning. Thank you to all of us, or all of you who, who joined with us this morning. Um, it was a pleasure to, to be with you all today. And next week, Dr. Galindo and I will be doing part two of our um, Becoming a Resilient Caregiver series. Great. Um, so we hope to see you back for that. Thank you, Kim. Thanks, Melissa. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And we'll see you all next right. time. See you next time. Bye-bye.